welcome back to the Seeky Strength YouTube. This is the first episode of the podcast that we're putting up on YouTube. Now we want to video all the others with me and Fitz with obviously good quality equipment as well as bringing you know the high quality audio that we bring to the podcast. However, Broderick is a incredible guest. It was one of our favorite podcasts. We really enjoyed it. Um, I hate when these fucking prelusions go on too long and people start advertising stuff. And you just want to listen to the podcast. So Broderick is a great guest. Just wanted to let you know that we're bringing this one from the future ones with us will be videoed, but this episode is fantastic. Uh, Project's a great guest. So without further ado, here is the Seek a Strength podcast with Project Chat. I don't know. We'll just get going, I suppose. Um, Project, thank you for coming on the podcast. I, I think the simplest way of describing you would be you are one of the leading experts in the practical application of performance hunting drugs would that be fair do you think that's kind of like a firm what most people would know you as um i don't like to take credit you know yeah just proclaim shit but um I, that's certainly the field in which i work yeah. whether or not i'm you know the leading authority is probably a very debatable concept but uh that is definitely the field in which i work make my way and uh it holds my interest and so you routinely work with athletes who have this pesky issue of needing to avoid a positive result, right? Yeah, I'm. I, I, yeah, I um, I'm regularly asked, you know, to do like podcasts based on like you know natural athlete themes and those yeah. sorts of things, and I, I consistently turn them down, not because, it, not not for any um, biased or prejudiced reason, other than. It's simply not my skill set. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the comparative I always use is, you know, you take your car to that dealership because that's who works on that car. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a sports car, you take it to a performance shop. If you have a family wagon, you take it to that shop. And I view the natural athlete as the family wagon. It's just <laughs> so boring, you know, annoying wood panel bullshit that doesn't hold my interest. Um, and, and because of that, I'm not an expert in it. But you do help people who um, who do encounter drug tests routinely, so people who need to avoid um, testing positive, I suppose. And we, Absolutely. We... I mean, with, with drug use comes, unfortunately, and, you know, in my opinion, rather unethically, drug testing as a concept. So, yes, you know, there are modality schemes and approaches that can be applied that are certainly not foolproof, but yeah. pretty successful at dodging drug tests i mean it's it it's literally i view it like a game it's like a game of chess for every move you make i'm supposed to know the opposite move to make on my side and that's you know that that's what it is there's a rule book we read it and then we play the game accordingly yeah so how does somebody get into this field so what's your kind of background and how did this all start um, I am a very, very unique creature. Probably no one out there could could or would even want to follow the, the path I took. Um, I was athlete first, intellectual second. Um, obviously, I had high intellectual capacity. You know, genetics are genetics, I suppose. But everything I did, every uh, avenue I pursued was literally for the purpose of um, furthering my own athletic acumen. I needed to know how these things work so I could do them. And then along the way, it turns out I have pretty good ability to you know, relay information, good strong language skills, et cetera. So it became a, a sideline to coach and help other people. But ultimately, every single thing I did, I did for purely 100% selfish reasons because I wanted to be bigger, stronger, and faster than I currently was. And the only you know, lever available for me to pull was, you know, pharmacokinetic. And so what was your athletic outlet? Were you a football player or? Um, I, I actually started as a bodybuilder. I was literally, again, I don't like to, you know, proclaim things, I, I you know, but I was given credit as being rather a prodigy bodybuilder. I was, you know, national level in my teens, uh, competed in well over 20 con uh, you know, high level contests as a teen, um, transition from team bodybuilding into uh, strength sports, powerlifting strongman. I was one of the top 220s in the world in powerlifting for, for a brief time. Um, I was never 
again, I don't, I don't like to say things like this because you sound like an ass. And, and even <laughs> now saying it, I sound like an ass. But I was never hyper interested in competing. Competing to me was just a necessary evil to periodically just kind of remind everybody that I was there. But honestly, it was the training, the eating, and the you know intellectual prowess and, and, and intellectual game that was the whole thing that really in, engaged me. I would much rather have gone to the gym than gone to a contest. Yeah. And so when was kind of the, um, the first time someone approached you and they were like, Project, I need help with this, this whole kind of... It, it didn't happen as a, as a moment. It, it happened in pieces. When I was very, very young, I, literally, I walked into a commercial gym when I was age 10, had been already strength training previous to that. Um, by, by age 13, 14, um, I was in communication with Dr. Fred Hadfield, Tom Platts, uh, Tom Dieters, big, big names, real, you know, real movers. And so it was a situation where I would be exposed to them and then people would be like, what they say, what they say. And so I was almost immediately kind of this conduit. And, you know, initially it was just parroting, you know, well, Fred said this and I would say that. And then later it got to the point where I kind of became more the um, interpretive tool. Fred said this, but I'm pretty sure Fred meant this. Yeah. And so I wound up kind of being the, 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 the conduit and then – you know, of course, you know, if you're, if you're reasonably intelligent, you have access to people like Fred Hatfield, you know, and you're competing on the national level, you start to develop your own, you know, secret sauce. And so it kind of became, you know, Fred said this, I think that plus my own little herbs and spices. And it just kind of grew. Uh, it never was that one moment where I'm like, oh, shit, I'm a coach. It just kind of, I was always in a favorable kind of social intellectual position that made people want to know what I knew. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. If that makes any sense. I don't yeah. even know if that makes sense. The uh, one thing I'll point out here, and I don't, again, I don't want to sound like the old curmudgeon, you know, get off my lawn asshole, but you've got to remember I'm almost 50. The things I'm speaking about were in a pre internet era. Okay. We're talking about, you know, paper documents and long distance telephone. Like it was a, it was a much different world. So information was much more valuable and much harder to, to locate. Yeah. Yeah. And is that the kind of the big change you've seen from when you started off uh, in that kind of in operating in those circles is the biggest thing you've seen is between uh, doping and anti-doping now, is it the availability of information or is it something else? Um, no, that's – as far as drug use at large, it's that. Yeah. You know, in, in, you know, in my era in high school, when I, I was first starting anabolics at age 16, it was literally when I was in high school. You didn't just jump on, you know, Wikipedia, you know, or Google, get a, get a name, buy some Bitcoin, and have the mail to your house. It did, that didn't happen. You know, you literally had to know someone. You had to go somewhere. You'll get in a vehicle, drive to another state, you know, with fucking paper maps that you had to, you know, you do. It was a fucking circus. You know, it was not this, you know, user-friendly bullshit that it is today. So that's the first thing. And then, of course, yes, the the, the actual finding the you know, practical application, how to use these things, that was a person that you had to literally communicate with in person. Yeah. So – those were the major differences there. And then there was one other difference. And I don't want to romanticize the past and I don't want to romanticize drug use, but there was a, and I don't know the language here to make this sound less gay than it is. Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean it that way, but there was a, a, a mentorship is the only way I can word it. You would go to the gym where you knew the drugs were. And that's literally how it was done. You know, I know that there's a guy with drugs at that gym. So I would go to that gym and I would make myself visible and I would train my ass off and, you know, do little fucking cartwheels and handstands and make that person see me and make them see me every day and make them realize that I was in fact serious. Yeah. And I would literally have to face a measure of adversity. And, and at some point that person would determine, I think you've earned 
you know, yeah. your first bottle of Dianabol. Like it was there, it, there was a, there was a filtering process yes. that literally, and I don't joke, 85% of the people did not get through. Yeah. Now it's just push a button on the fucking internet and any fucking nitwit with a double digit IQ can, <laughs> fucking, you know, get, get fucking drugs. And it just, that's the difference. Yeah. Now I realize you're really interested more in the, the doping side of things, but you got to understand that the drug use itself was so much more parsed that if you actually got to the fucking drug part, you were either smart enough, capable enough, or dedicated enough that the next step wasn't a leap. Yeah. 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 I, I, I hope you understand the continuity of that. Yeah. I, I don't think the average person on the other end of the internet grasps the continuity of that. They just have this kind of indignant, well, you know, I fucking ask Siri, I, you know, I have, I have all the information you had and more. And it, th no, they fucking yeah. don't. They yeah. fucking don't. And as well, there's, there's no compensation or there's no amount of just reading will, will give you all the knowledge you get from five or six or eight years of training uh, that, comes along with that that's kind of trickle fed into you around everything around like recovery around how you adapt during a training cycle like there's a huge amount of things that just reading a textbook or watching youtube videos doesn't give you yeah and i i actually remember dr fred hatfield actually using that very example in a in a seminar he said you know imagine if you were a fucking de desert dweller and you'd never seen open water and you went to the library and bought a book on how to swim. And you read the book cover to cover and you were convinced, I know how to swim. And then somebody just pushed you into fucking water. Would you or would you not be able to swim? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ha having, pr having theory on something and having practical application are not the fucking same. very sense. different. Yeah. So then in terms of the, the kind of the anti-doping stuff, when did that start to become apparent? Is it Was it kind of hand in hand that... Uh, like just to because you were involved in those circles, did you get asked those questions? Well, to a small degree, it became a thing. I'm almost immediately out of the gate because some of the bodybuilding events I did were in fact natural. Oh, yeah. um, so right out of the gate for me, it was an issue. Minor because the testing was just really, really Mickey Mouse and low, you know, low tier. But it, but it was already a thing in my mind. And then I went to university. I went to University of Arizona, which um, kind of was a horrible socio-political choice for me, but a really good choice in that at that time they had one of the top track and field teams literally in the world. So a huge, well-financed track and field group, very proximal to Mexico where drugs were not illegal. You can kind of see where this is going. Yeah. So right out of the gate, I'm a strength athlete. I'm there. I'm in the life sciences program. I obviously take drugs. I fit, you know, just, you know, just literally just pulled into my lane and, you know, just did nothing but pick up speed. So not only was, you know, the NCAA slash ultimately, you know, at the time IOC, it was pre WADA, um, you know, doping concerns were on the radar but I had access to the human performance lab. I had analytical chemistry equipment. You know, I had basically anything a person could want plus professors that could fill gaps in anything I didn't know. So it was, it was a very, very productive time, uh, both for the, the athletes around me and for my you know intellectual growth. So from an intellectual point of view, that was clearly very enjoyable having kind of a, an almost obviously people's careers and stuff would have been kind of at risk and are at risk now. But from your point of view, it would have been very interesting just to figure all this out. You know, as you say, it was kind of like a game of chess. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was the, and, and honestly, you know, in, in a, in a, a, a kind of a, a, a sick sort of way, the failures were much more exciting than the, than the successes. <laughs> Every time somebody passed a drug test, all you knew is they passed. You never knew by how much. And yeah. so it was the failures that we really attacked and you know, reverse engineered and trying to find the red line. And so that was the interesting stuff, if you will. Um, I, you know, and then, of course, there was also an, a period in time where there was an explosion of varietals. You know, pre-1990, I, I turned up at you know, university late 1990, um, 
you know, pre-1990, I mean, steroids were like five fucking things. Like there was a really narrow, you know, demographic of, of drugs, you know, uh, testosterone, which by the way, isn't even an anabolic steroid, but we'll momentarily pretend like it is. You know, there was testosterone, dietabol, anadrol, winsterol, primabolin, nandrolone, trenbolone, fuck you're running out of things. That was, that was getting on to it. Yeah. You know, but then on about 1990, suddenly, uh, and actually it was before that, but it was very quiet and in track and field circles, but insulin, uh, exogenous growth hormone, beta adrenergic agonists like clombuterol were starting to build favor in certain circles. So the, the, the width and birth of tools was exploding right in that time frame. And so on that kind of note of you had your kind of your basic ingredients at that point, a lot of times we hear about people kind of saying, oh, well, they're passing tests because they have designer steroids or they have this magical fucking 10 grand a bottle kind of worth of equipment. Like, is that is that a thing you experience or is it still just? Oh, absolutely. It's a thing, but it's certainly not the predominance of thing. The reality is, and you, you gentlemen probably know this by virtue of you know, doing what you do, but most athletes benefit from being bigger and stronger. No question. It's almost 100% guarantee. However, if you look at the entire effect profile of an anabolic steroid, it's an elevation in strength, but it's also an elevation in body weight via water, carbohydrates, ion distribution. There's a lot of factors that go on. So in reality, for instance, we'll just pick a sport, 100-meter running. Most 100-meter runners go out of their way, drug test or otherwise, to not be using drugs at the time of the race, they can get, you know, we'll just use, you know, quantifiable numbers. These are not you know, relevant to reality, but they get, let's say 120% of the necessary strength they need. Stop training that trait. Stop taking those drugs. Yes, they diminish, but only by a margin that they can literally coast into the event unmedicated and still be 95 to 105% of their target strength. With no drugs. Yeah. yeah. So a, a certain amount of the beating the drug test is just fucking periodization and organization. And then if you take that simple strategy and then you know how they look for drugs and what they're looking for, now you can start to make even more informed decisions about what you use and how. And suddenly the chances of them catching you are about as fucking likely as an alien landing on your front fucking lawn. <laughs> so, Broderick, I think something that's... Uh like a lot of kind of general populations will have heard of is that thing of cycling off and that thing of like uh, some people and especially people who listen to this will have heard of kind of uh, cycling off periods or washout periods. Can you just talk about maybe like the difference between certain compounds and why certain ones would hang on in the system longer and why others would be faster? Well, sure. I mean, to, to some degree where that you're, you're getting into a conversation about, you know, organic chemistry, which is going to be, you know, lurious and, you know, not in the most. So I'll be incredibly general, but the number of years to this, first of all, people don't actually go for the drug. That's a bit of a fallacy. You, you don't like go give blood. They're like, oh my God, there's Diana Paul in your blood. <laughs> That's right. you, you, you don't find the drug in your blood. The reason for that is these things behave um, in, in a very um, predictable manner, something in chemistry and, and general science at large called half life. Most of these drugs have a half life less than 12 hours, at least the oral versions. Some of them as little as four. What half life means is okay, you swallow a, again, I'll use absurdly round and inappropriate numbers, but just for the sake of you know, quickly being easy to follow, you swallow a 100 milligram tablet. You have 100 milligrams in you for four hours. At the end of four hours, you only have 50 milligrams. At the four more hour mark, you only have 25. At the four more hour mark, you're down to 12. And so the drug itself decays in a linear progression via half-life, to a point where the drug itself is no longer detectable. However, if you think of drugs like Legos and they're, you know, think of the atoms as Legos and you put them together into these complicated molecules, when you break that apart, now you have 
not the original thing, but you have two pieces. Those are called metabolites. Many of those metabolites are in fact detectable and behave according to their own half-lives, which happen to be much longer. So many of the downstream metabolites of these drugs do in fact linger around for a much longer time because they themselves have a longer half-life via being more resistant to degradation. The catch here is all of this is very specific. There isn't a universal dipstick, you know, oh, there's drugs in your blood. It's literally, you're taking product A and they're looking for product B, they don't find it. If you're taking product B and they look for product A, they don't find it. It's very specific, okay? So what that means is you can take a pretty well-known, well-understood product and make a very nominal change to that product and they simply don't find it. Or if they do find it, the half-lives are so redistributed that they don't find it when and where they expect to, i.e. don't find it. So that's that's basically what those designer steroids that people talk about or you hear people on like uh, CNN or whatever when someone gets tested and there's a positive and they said, oh, he was taking a designer steroid. Is that the kind of thing that they're looking for in those uh, in those products, something that has very short half-lives? Not always, but many times, not always. The problem with a very short half-life is you're physiologically exposed to it for a very brief period of time. So to get any measurable physiological adaptation out of the compound, you have to take it frequently. So it kind of, in a, in a way, defeats the purpose. Um, I'll give you an example. I don't think this is throwing anyone under the bus because it's bordering on ancient history at this time. Uh, Belco, Bay Area Lab Company, yeah. the, that name ring yeah. a bell? Yeah, yeah. All right. I will tell you the brilliance of Belco. And they really were brilliant in that they didn't do anything clever. That's how fucking brilliant they were. Okay. When any drug company, name your drug company, you know, Sharon Plow, Pfizer, okay, when they begin research on a thing, they start at a very undeveloped, low level, you know, rudimentary point. And what they do is they go to their lawyers and the lawyers file what's called a conditional research patent. It's not meant to be a patent to own thing. It's basically like renting rights. Like we're going to be studying this hands off, but at some point we're going to relinquish it or actually patent it and then you're permanently removed from it. Okay. Yeah. So they're getting these conditional research patents to be allowed grace time to do some work on a given thing. And then they'll progress it to the next level. They may or may not take conditional research patent on that and so on and so on. The moral of the story is at the end, they only patent, you know, Viagra or, you know, you know, whatever. And all of the stuff before it, they discard because they don't want to pay to protect inferior product. All of that leaves a paper trail in court that lawyers can find. And so all Balco did was pay the lawyers to go through the re conditional research patents and find not the finished product, but just before the finished product. That by definition wasn't the finished product, therefore different. Just go, yeah, it probably didn't work as well, but no one's gonna fucking look for it. They run off to a lab, oh. synthesize it, and they had a fucking they had the keys to the fucking kingdom. Oh my god, that's so, crazy. So you know, the, was it the the clear? Was that what the Balco's kind of? Yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. the exact product I'm talking about. So hundred percent. So was there nothing special in particular about clear compared to any of the other? anabolics you named not only was there nothing special about it it was literally an inferior product that a drug company chose not to patent Fuck. because they found problems oh, with it but the, the again one of the things i've said a hundred times and you haven't even asked me this but i find drug testing immoral for a slew of fucking reasons one of them is it pushes athletes to use more dangerous, more inferior products and practices than they would if they were just left the fuck alone to take the drugs, eat the food, lift the weights, and run like hell. It's fucking ridiculous. So if athletes were left alone, what would they be doing if there was no drug testing? What would be the, I suppose... Well, let's look at it, let's look at it this way, yeah. for instance. And, and, and I don't mean this is super not intended to be sexist. It's not meant to be anything other than an example that's just hanging out there. 
Okay. When was the last anabolic steroid, roughly speaking, patented? Do you have a vague idea on that? I have no idea. Most people don't. Yeah. Er Early 80s. Literally, like 82, give or take, was the last relevant patent in anabolic steroids. Okay. Fuck. So you're talking about products that the newest one, 40 fucking years old. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's numbers. I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not being crazy here. That's just fucking math. We can agree on that. Okay. Now. Dial back the hands of time and think about what birth control was like 40 fucking years ago. Yeah. It yeah. barely worked. It was highly dangerous. It you slew of fucking problems. Now, I'm not trying to equate, you know, looking good at the beach to, you know, population control. I understand women's concerns. I get it that birth control was a far more important, relevant social issue. I get it. But I'm just pointing out that we're talking about sex hormones. We're talking about the development and practical application thereof. Look at the advancements that were made in that field in 40 years. If the same or even a fraction of the same amount of time and money was put into sports drugs, we would have drugs today that work 10 times as well, have half the side effects, and basically we wouldn't be having this fucking conversation. Yeah. Yeah, But no, Joe Biden and his floppy fucking liberal dick had to (laughs) just fucking get turned down by every fucking cheerleader in college, and now nobody can have steroids. It's fucking embarrassing. It's it's an embarrassment to the human race. When the aliens come, I'm going to say I am not with them. (laughs) I I shit you not. Uh, so Broderick something about like the development of of new compounds and the thing we're we're seeing a lot here and I think it's the same in in the US is that SARMs are becoming much more of a thing and they're becoming much more of a dialogue in the kind of the everyday gym gore that you're hearing more about it yeah yeah that's you're you're absolutely right that's true um it, it, I, I, I just it, it, I can't avoid this topic. It just comes up over and over and over. All right. Let me give you my just blanket, just off the cuff thoughts on SARMs. Go for it. In terms of athletics, and there is a giant bifurcation here between clinical medicine and athletics. I'll come back and address clinical medicine in a moment. When it comes to athletics, SARMs are metaphorically, if not in fact practically, the tip of Satan's cock. <laughs> Why is that? You can say anything you want. Literally yeah. anything. Oh, I, I'm, I'm going to. You, you're you going to have to throw this away otherwise. Because I just there's I, I don't come with a filter. You just have to fucking deal with that. Okay. Going back to clinical medicine. Okay. What are these drugs designed to do? What are the clever, well-educated, highly paid Organic and analytical chemists, what are they trying to accomplish? Okay, that's where you need to start the conversation. What are they trying to accomplish? Okay, they are trying to isolate protein expression, genomic protein expression, and excise everything else. Okay. Now, what are athletes trying to accomplish when taking anabolic steroids? If it was just a matter of build a little bit more muscle per unit recovery branch chain amino acids and fucking massage would do that most of the effects that athletes prize are side effects the escalation of body weight the re- the, the retention of the upregulation of creatine synthase glycogen synthase the uh, pain tolerance issues all of those things the aggression the, the emotional changes the raging erections start naming your things that athletes prize those are technically fucking side effects think about this i don't know how much drug lore you know but how many times have you heard this sentence or at least i could tell you how many times i've heard this fucking sentence oh i i tried primaballin for a little bit but it just it didn't feel like it was working well what the fuck does muscle growth feel like no i'm not <laughs> I was wondering where you were going to what go. They're saying, what they're saying in their incredibly childlike linguistic skills, what they're saying is, I didn't get aggressive. I didn't get a raging re- erection. I didn't froth at the mouth to go to the gym. So clearly it wasn't working. <laughs> Primabolin literally is the drug that straddles the line between SARMs and actual anabolic steroids. And people already define they don't fucking like that. <laughs> 
So why are you? Quite- and, and by the way, what I'm spouting here is this isn't like high level, you know, you know, university chemistry. This is fucking logic. Yeah. Like you should be able to draw this on a fucking napkin with a dirty fucking butter knife at a Denny's. It's not complicated. So, so would you? Would that is it in effect saying that the SARMs would not be as effective because they lack or potentially lack those side effects? 100 percent i mean and again once again we're not going with my opinion let's go with reality there are nitrogen retention essays there are gobs and gobs of fucking studies that show that they have approximately the same side effect profile with about a third of the total effect that's not a fucking score now if you were a child a housewife a burn patient a cancer patient you had hiv any of these things where a raging hard on and a bad attitude and all would be pretty negative then like i said for clinical medicine wonderful thing they can take can a bit less actual muscular action if they can excise all of the unnecessary baggage yep. that's a yeah. score yeah and by the way the average burn patient is not trying to gain 20 kilos they're literally just trying to you know regrow some skin yep. so again it's it's application versus necessity they're appropriate for clinical medicine. They're completely, wholly, and utterly inappropriate for for sports. Do you think there is unforeseen long term effects of SARMs because they have been around? So we've long? already seen it. Yeah, we've already seen it. Really? We're already showing HPTA downregulation and and androgen suppression, which you know shouldn't happen because they're not sex hormones, but we're seeing it. Yeah. Which, by the way, Dan Duchesne prophesized in like 1980 fucking two. He suspected that the actual act of a drug binding to the AR receptor caused some unknown feedback loop that ultimately resulted in suppression. And now we're literally seeing it. The technology wasn't there to even validate such a thought, but he had that thought again, 40 fucking years ago. So on a random tangent there, but you mentioned earlier that testosterone isn't an anabolic steroid. What do you mean exactly with that? Well, again, like, again, and people ask me that. I don't mean to be asked to you specifically, but um, there, there's a thing. Uh, I don't. It's, it's amazing. I actually don't have one here. Um, uh, there's a, a word in the English language, and I realize you guys are on the opposite side of the Atlantic, so English is a tenuous thing. I get it. But there's a, a word in the English language called diction. Okay, and because of that, we have a book named after called a dictionary. Okay, a book where we keep all our fucking diction. If you open that to fucking testosterone, you will find that it is defined as an androgen. Okay. Then if you look up the word anabolic steroid, you will find that it says a synthetic derivative of testosterone. It's precluded. It's in the definition. So it's precluded from that definition. Testosterone is one thing and anabolic steroids are a different thing made from that thing. Testosterone is an androgen. Were you to look that word up, you would find that it's predicated of the original Greek root, andro, male, androgen, that which makes male. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. I, I, people criticize me for, for, the, for having these views. I'm just reading it out of the fucking book. It's not an opinion. Yeah. I'm just parlaying fucking fact. Absolutely. Like language has to be precise. So especially when you're talking about things like well, this. But that's the point. That's what yeah. science is. Yeah. The language isn't precise. There's just fucking noise coming out of the front of your fucking head. Uh, so we spoke about like some kind of clickbaity topics uh, already. And I suppose to go on one of the more clickbaity topics again. And I know Owen spoke to you last week when we were setting this up. And he said, uh, like, everybody knows CrossFit is an incredibly dirty sport. But what yeah. kind of things are happening in CrossFit? Are, is it just that the testing doesn't happen? Or is it just that the testing is so lax that it's like the bodybuilding in the early 80s? Um, it's my experience that it's all the, the specific best case scenario. They are applying the test. They're doing their job. The variety of testing is not particularly sensitive or, or complex. So almost any athlete moderately funded and triple digit intelligent can dodge the test. It's not that hard. Yeah. So, so right out of the gate, you know, all things equal and all above board test is not that fucking complex. Secondly, 
the testers are lazy and poorly funded, so do as well as they should. And then secondly, we're seeing right now, comically, perfect moment in time, CrossFit's a fucking cult. Yeah. It, it, it literally, it's a religious order. And like any religious order, there are cliques and there are golden children. And there are people out there that have never, and I, I know this is a goddamn, there are people out there that have never taken any of the tests they're credited with passing. It's just, it, it's a schmoz. It's an absolute fucking circus. I literally know of a case where one of the anointed failed a drug test because his training partner, who was his drug tester or drug test, I don't, his, his surrogate. Yeah. Accidental, accidentally took some drugs and <laughs> the surrogate fucking failed. So the person who he was probably paying to piss into his cup. Yes. Correct. <laughs> That is fantastic. Uh, yeah. So we like we spoke about it before uh, on the podcast that CrossFit is basically a sport uh, not designed perfectly for, for doping, but it's a sport that would benefit hugely from doping. Could you maybe just go into some of the things that, uh, like the fact that there's huge strength and speed and endurance? Well, that, that- that's the thing. That's the thing. Like you look at like hundred meter sprinting, you look at shot putting, you look at name any sport. I mean, even when you get to more complex dynamic sports like skating, like like figure skating or uh, for gymnastics, the number of traits you're trying to at any one moment in time are relatively narrow. Over the course of a year, proper periodization, there might be specializations on strength, speed, power, flexibility, et cetera. But in general, come time of presentation, the thing you're presenting is relatively narrow. CrossFit is in fact, even bodybuilding, for instance, the, the, you know, there's no real requirement for speed. There's no real requirement for strength. It's just being hyperinflated and lean. That's it. CrossFit is in fact the absolute most requisite sport on earth for drugs because you're simultaneously trying to present an elite package of every fucking characteristic the human body can present, which is exactly impossible. (laughs) It is literally the expression of an impossible sport. You can't simultaneously have high aerobic capacity, high momentary torque production, high lean mass, low body fat, high coordination, high recovery. That's it's, it's a fucking unicorn. The sheer fact that that sport exists is proof that people like me exist. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And then meanwhile, there's legions of fucking housewife and fuckwits. You're just trying to do this shit and they don't realize that they're duped on such a fundamental fucking level that they're literally trying that they're they're fucking they're they're fat, dumpy pithicans trying like leaping off a cliff like lemurs thinking they're going to fucking fly. Yeah. Like lemmings. It's fucking embarrassing. Yeah. I think the crazy thing is you'll see somebody starting CrossFit who's they might be in their early 30s. They've probably been away from sports or athletics for a while. They now come back in having seen the results of of people who are at the games or even people who are winning national competitions. And they expect that level after six, eight months, two years. And they don't understand that, like, you're not going to fucking look like Rich Froning. Uh, And, like, they do it because they want that certain aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Like, everybody says they want to perform better. Realistically, the vast amount majority of people who are no, going... No, they want to get laid. Exactly. Yeah, it's 100%. Yeah. They want to get laid. Yeah. I, I, I don't even understand why there's such a dialogue on that. Like, yeah. all these people, yeah. they, they come to me with all these weird, coy wish lists. I'm like, you're, you, want, you want to get laid, don't you? Yeah. Like, all right. Yeah. Fuck. Um, just, I, like, another question I just had is, coming into this, so, every, like, everybody on the street knows that, like, steroids are going to make someone stronger. I think some of the Correct. things that, like, some of the more interesting, like, my background is sports psychology. Some of the more interesting things are the kind of the the possible changing of, like, uh, like motor learning or motor cognition that might come along with a performance enhancing drug. Once again, it's not a might. It's There's, yeah. there's exactly zero question on this topic. There's exact. First of all, we have a really good biological model called fucking puberty. Okay, that whole you throw like a girl, that's because you're a fucking girl. And then 
puberty happens and you're exposed to testosterone and therefore DHT and therefore there's neurological plasticity and remodeling and then suddenly instead of throwing like a girl you throw like a fucking boy then later a, a you know a, a young man and then a man why because you have chemical exposure to the tools necessary to do that there's zero argument. Anyone who studied fucking anything from embryology up knows that that's not a question. That's a statement. Now, anybody in my position knows that as you employ more and more androgenic, that which makes male definition, diction, that which makes male, you can drive, transiently drive neurological adaptations that are positive for tool production. But again, we, 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 we know this. Yeah. We do it. So- so is that again a side effect of the drug and it's not a direct effect of taking x drug makes you learn better it's is it an effect of taking any drug along with these kind of broad adaptions to your body or is it correct but through clever selection you can prioritize which effect slash side effect you prize the most momentarily just like periodization and training things change along the year because your goals change along the year so like one of the kind of stranger uh, positive tests I heard of last year was so bridge the card game was that the uh, the guy who had won the bridge world championships had tested positive for growth hormone and for testosterone is it possible uh-huh. that the testosterone he's taking there is having a positive effect on him newly then and it is actually a performance of yeah okay of course Again, again, the, the, again, people want to want to badger me about my opinion and they just don't know any history. Yeah. OK, go back to the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, um, a, a famous skater who was let go from Disney. She was let go from her. She was a, 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 a figure skater, the Disney princess bullshit, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, Katarina Witt, Katarina Witt. OK, she was part of the her drug program. She's given a specific DHT derivative, not for its masculinizing properties, not for its anabolic properties. Your laws in fine motor learning and therefore made her skate more precise. Yeah. Okay. Again, not my opinion. This is fact. This is in the historical record. Okay. You just got to dig it up and look and I see it for what it fucking is. These drugs have been used repeatedly for that purpose. I don't know this a fact, but I won't even say I was consulted, but it was to my opinion and my opinion was asked by somebody in the mix about a neurosurgeon literally using a high androgenic anabolic compound purely for the purpose of improving his ability to perform fucking brain surgery. Yeah. So is it is it interact- Which, by the way, where's Joe Biden? Like, well, you know, what the fuck? Why is he coming in there? Like, oh, stop it! You, you can't save people's lives with with you know performance enhancing drugs. Maybe you fuck can. him. I seriously hope he gets asshole cancer. <laughs> and so, does it affect your ability to remember these new lo- neurological patterns? So your ability to remember a particular movement, or does this just enhance your ability in that moment to kind of? internally compromise that movement like to really just upgrade it all of the above all of the above through many many different pathways many of which i i dare say quite sincerely i'm not even qualified to speak on but these are very systemic global hormones they have effects on the actual neuron they have impacts on the myelin sheath from neuron to brain they have impacts on neurotransmitters they have impacts on calcium ion channels so they're they're causing minor and in some cases major upregulations in almost every aspect of that plus the sheer overriding sympathetic elevation which raises your engagement your arousal etc so it's a really really systemic domino type effect that culminates in profound changes so so that would make sense from an evolutionary perspective of if you are more androgenic, your ability to hunt would probably be hyper. So ability to throw a spear or something like that would be hyper kind of influence and much better than it would be otherwise. One hundred percent, and uh, exactly, and and you know, there, there's, and, you know, there's no aspect. It's funny, like you, you know, the three of us here are bearded. Like people don't even understand like such fundamental biology. Why do males have a beard if females don't, or or the, the potential to have a beard? Yeah. It's literally brought on by androgenic actions of the male hormone 
for the purpose for the purpose of creating um, padding and reduced friction from striking. It's literally a combat defense mechanism. It's been shown repeatedly that men with a beard are much less likely to suffer a broken jaw than men without a beard. It's literally just one more example of why the evolutionary paths took what they took and why androgens do what they do and how bloody fucking obvious and literally pun in your face it is. <laughs> just on, on that point, uh, Broderick, is there any kind of side effect or is there any effect that people don't usually uh, like the lay person or even people who are involved in sports don't usually attribute to like performance enhancing drug? Uh, that is kind of that has a lot of efficacy but more so that's like that people would never think of there's there boy there that's see that's going to kind of be niche it's going to kind of depend on what sport are you talking about for instance you know why was lance armstrong taking testosterone he's you know he's a fucking big rounds of you know of a fucking coke bottle why you know he's clearly not hyper muscular what was he doing in that case, they were purely using that drug for pain tolerance, aggression, and phlebotomy. Drive red blood cell count, hematocrit, hemoglobin, the ability to carry oxygen. Whereas you move laterally to like you know, uh, skating, no, the average person wouldn't really think that it improves fine motor skill, Yeah, but yet it does. Yeah, Move even more laterally to... Um, Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, a, a sport like um, like gymnastics. There's a huge segment of doping compounds there, purely to bulletproof connective tissue against the radical impacts, the really high dynamic yeah. forces of direction changes from jumps and that sort of thing. So, it, it, you know, and, and I'm fucking again, people don't have, people don't have the slightest in, inclination like. These drugs are used in chess. These drugs are used in you know, card games, um, porn. I don't. I don't know of a porn star that's not. You know, I mean, I don't know all of them, but I mean, <laughs> I know the ones that paid me. Yeah. I mean, I, I know the ones that paid me, and it's a fair fucking number are using pharmacology. <laughs> By the way, both male and female. Thank you, fucking very much. Oh, really, really, um, very interesting. One hundred percent. That's my father worked for Pfizer when they um when they developed Viagra and that basically uh that absolutely changed the game for that for Pfizer as a pharmaceutical company. Absolutely. Yeah. And once again, what an excellent example of side effect versus effect. That drug was pushed through development for um angina. That drug was put through trials as a cardiac medicine, hoping to replace um um nitroglycerin. And along the way, one of the things they were finding is one of the predominant side effects was that people were complaining about rampant erections. You know, they're having chest pains. Meanwhile, they're sporting fucking wood. <laughs> and lo and behold, somebody got the idea. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe this is in the wrong lane. I think that was actually in some kids as well that they they were administering. Really? Yeah, I think some kids were getting raging boners. So they were like, <laughs> fuck. Uh, on that actual subject of over-the-counter medicines do you utilize is there any notable ones that you utilize in in kind of olympic direction kind of sports routinely that are well see there again once again there's a huge problem in that question the world contrary to you know utopian liberal numbnuts the world is not borders and boundaries all over the fucking place and what's otc in one country is fucking prohibited in another yes it's there clenbuterol a... yeah clenbuterol is over the counter in most of south america Let's say is there, is there, an example. Is there any ones that are kind of very generic? You know, like something as generic as like aspirin or something like that. Is there anything like that people wouldn't particularly have heard well, of? I, again, I mean, you you know, you you kind of stuck 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 your toe in it. Aspirin, for instance, is highly used by myself and others as a hedge against some of the in, in, unavoidable impacts of anabolic use the aforementioned tour de france using testosterone and anabolic steroids depending on which one can really elevate phlebotomy that can elevate your risk of blood clot your potential problems with dehydration etc yes. so using a drug like aspirin just adds a little bit of viscosity protection against 
those impacts, just like you would use it as a, for a heart condition. NSAIDs across the board are used to reduce repetitive use injuries. You've got drugs that allow your muscles and your mind to recover radically. Your joints might be exposed to less proximal recovery abilities. So as your anabolic dose goes up, your training volume, perhaps what is your anti-inflammatory you know, re requirements? Um, I mean, I'll give you an example that's much probably usable to anyone listening. The body, under most conditions, operates, dare I say, in a very natural environment. The amount of activity you're able to do versus the amount of calories you're able to consume versus the amount of micronutrition in that calories all very roughly equates. But now you introduce an exogenous compound that radically changes some of those values. You can suddenly, for instance, a normal person has normal, say, zinc values. Zinc is the major cofactor between hormone and receptor. Normal people have normal amounts of both receptors, zinc, and hormone, all is happy. If driving the value of hormone up, you can be zinc deficient even though to a normal person, you're not at all, but to the conditions you are. So using exogenous zinc yeah. can actually raise the efficacy of these hormones. Same thing applies to chromium in the case of rather, rather than sex hormones to both insulin and growth hormone. It's one of the major cofactors laying and responsible for binding and uncoupling at the target receptor. Oh, lovely. No, I was just saying, so in the last kind of two weeks, there's been a lot of revelations in weightlifting um, just around kind of corruption, but anti-doping was deeply tied into that uh, corruption. Just uh, in terms of passing tests, right? So we've, like, from that report, a lot of it was passing tests through just um, through just purely paying someone off and, and that level of, uh, level of corruption. In terms of athletes passing tests most of the time, if you're dealing with them, is it that it's an organization is bringing you in to get their athlete to pass, or is it an athlete is bringing you in uh, irrespective of what the coaches know or irrespective of anything like that? Once again, the world is not one place. Okay. In the United States, things are not particularly well organized. It's why Olympically we basically suck. Yeah. It's because capitalism and free markets have made it a free-for-all. Everybody's out for themselves. There's no organization. Now you move to, say, Scandinavia. It's not government powered, but it's more kind of club and organizationally powered. And so a given weightlifting club or group or gym might bring in an expert to talk, you know, quote, to lecture. And then post lecture, there might be intimate, you know, conversations. Moving, you know, across the globe, you know, you might go to a country like, I don't know, South Africa, where blatantly there's a government dude paying you, you know, just here, come talk to these fucking athletes or knuckleheads. It depends. Again, people forget they have this utopian view that wherever they are, that's what the world looks like. And that's not true. Yeah. The, the South African rugby team were particularly jacked pre World Cup this yeah. year. All of them. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> so they, the longest camp in the history of a Rugby World Cup. And I don't think, like, I've been involved in rugby since I was four years of age. And I have never seen anything like the physical condition. But we, we heard some of the numbers coming out of them. Yeah, was... like a lot of those guys are training in our club here. Like a lot, like uh, Munster Rugby has a very strong club link. We've had head coaches mm -hmm. from South Africa. We have a lot of players going over and back. Um, and... Some of the South African boys are coming in hot. 120 <laughs> kilos, absolutely shredded. Yeah. And they're like fucking five foot six. You know, like it's... We'll be lynched if we talk about Irish rugby like that though. So yeah. we better move on. Um, <laughs> the, you know, we always hear this. Um, it's, the, it's the party line. When an athlete fails a drug test and they are a popular athlete, they go, my supplements were tainted. Is that... How often does that happen? Do you think that's a legitimate... Because we hear it literally every time someone and they all can't be tasting yeah. or tainted supplements well there is there, there there's a I'll, I'll i'll circle back to an instance that that has a teeny bit of relevance but the my otc supplements were tainted or my beef 
or horse yeah. or whatever the fuck they're yeah. eating yeah. was tainted is absolutely retarded. Allow me to explain. Again, I don't want to give everybody a fucking chemistry lesson. No, I'm not a chemistry it. professor and I'm not qualified to do that. But let's let's go with some, again, just shamefully obvious examples. If I had a bottle of testosterone, okay, and I tore the lid off of it, and I asked you, you, or my 14-year-old daughter to drink it, what would happen? Nothing. 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 100% nothing. You might get the shits for a day from the oil that it was <laughs> laden in, but elsewise, nothing. It is not, wait for it, wait, 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 not orally active. So unless they were doing something really weird with their supplements, it's not orally active. It's not orally active. They're only consistent supplements. Well, it's not fucking active. It's not orally active. What does that word mean? Get the book, read the page. It's not orally active. So if you're if you're not putting it somewhere really strange, you're covered <laughs> or not in this case. Yeah. Okay, so this idea that you know, beef got them to fail or whatever, it's fucking hogwash. Uh, with, with one exception, I will connotate, there was a failure for clembuterol nice. that was blamed on beef. That's possible. Clembuterol is a bit more resistant to both heat and time uh, and digestion. That's that's it, not utter fantasy. It's unlikely. It's yeah. nuts. But it's, it, it's you know at least capable within the chemistry but an anabolic steroid through beef is just it's just fucking made up an anabolic steroid through an otc supplement again just absolutely fucking made up now where it might be relevant uh i think it was 2017 there was an, a, a, an array of failures from india pakistan kazakhstan that little corridor there and they all failed for nandrola and any even reasonably good coach would know that nandrolone is a terrible compound to use, both for Olympic weightlifting and for detectable purposes. Yeah. So I was told that whatever the secret police of China, I don't know the name of their, the KGB of China, literally introduced trace amounts of nandrolone into the product that was being produced in china that was ultimately shipped to those places so they were buying product x but it was tainted with a small amount of product y which left them open to failure that's insane. that is fucking crazy holy shit yeah that that doesn't surprise me but hearing the details is is shocking like it's it's you know it doesn't sound shocking when you say it out loud but the fact that it happened is is hilarious yeah. that's um so is it still a, a case where the vast majority of, of anabolics are being produced or the raw compounds are being produced in China and then they're they're coming into the US or they're somewhere else and they're being packaged? Well, see, again, it's, it's far more insidious than that. People have this deluded belief that labels matter, okay? Let's momentarily skip steroids and talk about OTC supplements. Clear your mind momentarily. How many factories on fucking earth do you think are making creatine monohydrate? Hundreds. Three? Fuck. No yeah. way. Three. What? One of them's in Germany, two of them are in China. That's it. That's it. So out of the thousand products at the local store, no. one of three locations, period. End of story. That is fucking now, crazy. clear your mind again. How many companies out there do you think are making dairy proteins uh, no. it's a slightly larger number yeah, but yeah. it's certainly not the number of labels on the shelf yeah yeah you yeah. know we're talking like maybe to any measurable degree probably like 10 yeah, yeah. 10 facilities okay so out of the five thousand products it's one of 10 different things so this idea that you know, ingredients are localized and redistributed by brand this is not revelatory in any way okay when it comes to anabolic steroids, same thing. There's a factory in Kazakhstan. There's a cu couple in India, a couple in China. And that's about it. By the way, all these people like, oh, I just use Bayer Prima Testa. And I, uh, yeah, you know where Bayer buys their fucking t testosterone? The fucking producer in China. You don't think they're dicking around making 12 cent fucking. They're making high end fucking Lipitor and bullshit. They're not cranking out testosterone. 
circa circa 1930s technology. Yeah. yeah. Which, by the way, is how old the technology to make testosterone is. It, Look at the patent date again. Buy a book. It, um, it, yeah. The, the, you know. Now the difference is when Bayer or whoever buys testosterone from China, they're demanding much higher quality they're demanding more analytics they're making sure that they're getting what they're paying for because they have the funding and the temperament and patience to do that what doesn't pass their test is what they fucking package up and ship to you and i <laughs> or me anyway yeah like a, a crazy thing about china is we back in years and years ago uh before we started doing uh when seeker strength was a thing we originally were looking at like uh, different supplements we were looking at we brought in bhb salts from china and the the guys who were sending it from china said oh we can't export this because it's a dietary supplement so we're going to label it as something else so 20 kilos in assorted bags came there like to my house in a box just covered in chinese writing and he just sent me a legend and it was polyol a equals Poly L B equals, yeah. and then that's it. And you're just looking into these foil bags, and you're like, "Oh fuck!" Yeah, like whoever stopped this at the border had to have been thinking because we got a phone call being like, uh, "I have twenty kilos of white powder. <laughs> what is this?" And I was like, "Oh, it's it's like BHB salts or whatever. They're like ketone salts." He's like, "All right, we'll send them on." <laughs> Clearly, that happens so often. Yeah, um, that is um, that's mental about the creatine thing. That that is um. So it's incredibly unlikely that your creatine was contaminated with, unless your repackager contaminated with something to hype up their particular. Right, there's a vague chance that you know the the sanitation at the actual production was less than ideal, but that's fucking unlikely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a vague likely chance is the actual work table where they dumped out the product and weighed it yeah. more likely that was less than highly sanitary or more likely you just made up the whole thing and you were taking fucking drugs which is yeah. about 99 percent of the fucking you know thing roger i'm going to ask you a question that is definitely going to trigger you but i want to ask you anyway because <laughs> it will be good for the podcast all the same but Fair i get enough. i get this question like i cannot tell you often people ask me this question and obviously i can't say but People always ask, they're like, so weightlifting gets a really bad name for weightlifting. They're like, oh, everyone's on drugs in weightlifting. And then they'll go, do you think other gold medalists in sports are on drugs? And I'm like, oh. well, they're like, what percentage? And you're just I, like, I can't go for it. <laughs> well, I, I guess I guess to some degree, it depends on what sport you're talking about and how you define drugs. Yeah. But, you know, if you're using my definition of what a sport is and my definition of what a drug is it's been a hundred percent since 19 fucking 20. Yeah. It's, it's never not been ever. I'm going to clip this anywhere and play this all the time now for them. <laughs> uh, again, let's, let's do this as an experiment. Okay. And we're again, we don't have to go with my opinion. We can just go with very fundamental logic chain stuff. Okay. 1972, no drug test in the Olympics. Okay. So, you, you, you know, yep. you do the math, 76, you know, et cetera. Okay. 1972, Ken Patera, Vassal Alexia, Serge Redding, five fucking hundred pound overhead presses. Yep. Remember yep. that? Yep. Okay. Okay. Now, circa 1980 somewhere, drug test is inserted. Okay. So now we have a moment. We can, okay. Two possibilities. Do drugs work? Yes. Let's go. Yes. Okay. <laughs> were guys like Sir Dredging and Ken Patera taking drugs? Well, they said they were. So let's go. Yes. Yeah. You know, Ken Patera was rather famously said that the 72 Olympics would be a contest to see whose steroids were better, the Soviet Union or America. So let's say that he probably was doing that. So drugs were there and drugs worked. Okay. Bar here. Now you draw a line through history at no point do the records go down. Yeah. So if drugs were there and drugs worked and they didn't, athletes didn't stop using them and they stopped working, there's exactly zero possibility that drugs were removed from sports. So the only possibilities are they never worked or they were never there. Yeah. Yep. That's it. 
Like it's it's linear. You draw a fucking chart. Like it, again, we don't have to go with my opinion. We can do this in crayon. It's fucking simple. There is exactly zero analytical evidence for drugs being removed from sports. Yeah. It was actually in, I think it was 97 or it might have been 98 when uh, Lance Armstrong took the year out. And the Tour de France had this thing that they called it the, the Tour de Reform. Or there was this big rebranding where they were saying that this was going to be the year that it had now been cleaned up, that the bad people were gone. Uh, and they got it where after the first day, all the times had increased from the year before. And there was just this fucking shitstorm because everybody knew, everybody's seeing these posters that say like oh like the clean tour and the new face of cycling and then you've got the, the new face of cycling with the fucking dirty blood still in it well i, I mean again you we can go with like we don't have to go with my opinion we go with fact we go with ben johnson okay yeah possibly the most genetically elite human to ever grace a track okay perfect yeah. height perfect limb length perfect mechanics perfect fiber type you know for me Perfect. He was the archetypal sprinter. He used drugs. How do we know? Because he was caught. Okay. <laughs> the most elite creature on earth under the influence of drugs ran 979. So how are people going faster than that without yeah. drugs? Yeah. It's impossible. Anyone who knows anything about biology knows that that, that by definition is impossible. The fact that the next Olympics, it didn't go back to 10-2, proves that drugs were not removed. Yeah. Just that guy was removed. End of story. Uh, Project yeah, I absolutely. I mean, again, for, for all your listeners out there, I mean, a anyone who even has a slight confusion on that topic, l look up the famous paper, The Goldman Paradox. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, actually gone down know. recently. The, the amount of people who said they would do it have gone down since 2012, I think. Did you see the... Yeah, it's good, yeah, but it's still... 50 percent which oh, is yeah, yeah. you know 50 percent or better of the people are willing to blatantly die to collect a bullshit you know gold medal that most of the public doesn't give one fuck about yeah. so they're highly motivated <laughs> they're highly motivated project if you were given control of wada tomorrow and they were like project we need to we really we really want to catch everyone we can what are some of the things you do that would be oh my god well first of all i have to say this could just because this is a point of personal requisite i would absolutely positively not accept such a position under any conditions whatsoever i literally believe that drug testing is immoral wrong just i don't i did it, it, it i cannot be part of that were i put in wad in charge of wada i would rent all the wood chippers in the world and I would feed the former employees feet first into running wood chippers. Okay, that's what I think of WADA. Yep. But, Literally, I might piss on them as they're being ground to you know dog food. But let's, I, I literally think nothing of them. Let's say you okay? weren't evil. Let's say you were the good genius instead of the evil genius. Like let's say you took that WADA. Okay. The drug test is designed by its very nature to be defeatable. For instance, TET ratio rather than just an absolute test. You put an absolute upper limit on potential testosterone values and you test for it. That's going to catch 50% of the fucking field. Growth hormone, they use an isoform test rather than an absolute test. You just simply implement a, a total somatropic test. You'll catch the other half of the people. The tests are designed by their very mission to have a, you're allowed to cheat this much margin. First thing you can do is just eliminate that. You've caught most of the fucking people, put most of the major sporting or organizations out of business because, you know, marathons just got 20% longer. You know, there's no more four minute mile. Just, you know, you put most sports out of business. At that point, your job goes away and the project's over. So why don't they just, you know, they're like, well, because they don't want to catch people. They, like, they, no, it's like any. What's the purpose yeah. of a bureaucracy? Like literally, it's a, it's a yeah. basic political science question. Purpose of a bu bu bureaucracy: it's create conditions for the survival of the bu bureaucracy. So <laughs> they don't want to catch people. They want to ensure that they have a job next Olympics. W would it work if you just looked at that? Hey, let's say Darius, he's entered in sprinting, and you're like, we think Darius on drugs. Could they just go? Could they just test these testosterone levels? Like, I, know, I don't think that's done, is it? Like, just absolute, like, pre-testosterone or whatever. Would that, 
is there a particular reason they don't do that other than the aforementioned self-sufficient bureaucracy like would that we yeah work? there's just i mean again it's it's not hard to find out if people are taking drugs i mean you you look at basic metabolic panels you look at absolute values you know like everything there's there's deviation i mean there's there's a random individual out there somewhere that might operate at 2000 nanograms per deciliter but that's one of 7 billion so if yeah. you set the level at you know 200 2,225 nanograms per deciliter. There's no that could achieve that. It's done. Yes, there's still the, oh, but the person could cheat this much. But that's literally a third of how much you're cheating now, so it yeah. would fucking work. And the other thing is they'll probably there, all cheat the same amount. Like you have a much fairer playing field. Uh, if 100%. You, if you don't... Well, right. The, 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 threat, the death threshold is relatively similar among all humans. So the amount of cheating is literally capped by survivability a hundred percent that's that's never not the argument it's the 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 whole thing just drug testing across the board is and then you got to get into the argument of what is you they don't even fair definition of what drug not an ioc controlled water hey with almost every single athlete i work with for performance enhancing purposes so explain that um, there, you know, there's, there's not even a valid definition on what is a fucking drug there. The test is designed from the ground up to basically just be defeatable. There's, there's no, there's no relevance to any of it. It's just a, a, a bureaucratic extra wheel to make self-righteous, unathletic schmucks important. <laughs> I have said that before. I was like, I reckon a lot of WADA weren't athletes or good athletes in back in the day. Like you don't Definitely see. Definitely not. Ben Johnson's not working for WADA right now unless they have some. No, know, no. Vasily Alexia didn't work for WADA. Oh, yeah, you go through the list of people that are relevant to athletics. It's always the wannabes, the almost, and the not quites yeah. that get on their little fucking high horse and get their little. Yeah, what's the know. saying? Those who don't do teach and those who don't teach inspect. <laughs> it's they're just literally it's just yeah. horrible i have, i have zero respect for those people i have zero interest in them i like i said i, I would create quite a frenzy in the wood chipper industry <laughs> so project i think like my last question would be um obviously things have changed now with tokyo 2020 becoming tokyo 2021 the implications uh for somebody like yourself or for somebody who's involved in high level sport and coaching athletes do you think we're going to see a big jump in performance because we've had a worldwide lockdown and possibly a worldwide lockdown on drug testing as well? Oh, there's so much more to that conversation than you've, you've unlocked Pandora's box. <laughs> um, first of all, you got to understand that WADA is a bureaucracy and that they make their decisions, their seemingly arbitrary, whimsical decisions based on bureaucratic methodology when they hand down a suspension that suspension is despite the fact that the rule book says it should not be the suspension is strategically designed to punish said athlete for the next major games okay so we have a slew of doping suspensions that expire just post the original target date of the tokyo olympics which means suspiciously, they will all be fucking qualified for the new date. <laughs> and guess what? Also, by the way, talk about, oh, you, they don't really want to catch people. Guess what you don't do while you're suspended? You don't do any drug tests? Correct. <laughs> so literally, the people that have been identified as the most likely to be cheating are no longer checked to see if they're cheating. Wow. That's yeah. weird. That's yeah. almost like a schmoz. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. So literally, we have had a, a, a select, highly motivated, highly implicatory group of people in a fucking state of free-for-all, <laughs> and now suddenly they just need to tighten up, clean up their game, and they can go. So literally, the coming Olympics are going to be the anabolic Olympics. Yeah. We're not going to see a downturn in performance. We're going to see a horrific <laughs> upturn that's basically just going to put Wada in a position where they're either going to have to, it, metaphorically, as my grandfather would say, shit or get off the pot. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's what we were saying two weeks ago. It's like this is the perfect storm. You've got you've turned a four year cycle into a five year cycle. You've got people coming back from drug tests, and then you have a huge period of time where people aren't allowed into your country or aren't allowed to move around within the country. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. And, and more more importantly, I, and I have no idea what's going on in your countries, respectively. But in in America, nobody gives a fuck. Nobody cares. Nobody cares one bit. I, I hate them deeply, almost as much as the WADA people, but I, I, I have to begrudgingly credit the potheads. The potheads in this country have just worn down the resistance to drug culture to such a degree that anyone who previously had a bit of resistance to the idea is just like, just, just, I don't fucking care. I don't, I don't fucking care. And literally, no, everyone just assumes that everyone's smoking pot and taking steroids, and nobody cares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ireland's and with not yeah. caring is quickly going to become caring about funding something they don't care about. Yeah. So I'm gonna. I suspect in the very near future, the desire to give a lot of money is going to diminish, yeah. and that will be the thing that changes the playing field. Yeah. It, it is a lot of money as well every year. It is an astronomical amount Oh, yeah. Money. Yeah. And, and Well, I mean, that was the big joke. There was a comedian on TV saying exactly what I thought is, you know, all those Tour de France assholes so desperately wanted to catch, you know, Lance Armstrong. They so desperately wanted Lance Armstrong out of sports. But meanwhile, they weren't about to give back their fucking mansions and their Audis and their fucking yachts yeah, yeah. that they made literally on his back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, they weren't about to do that. Yeah, because everyone, like, everybody knows about Lance. Nobody knows any other fucking cyclists except the people Lance sued and who were in his lawsuits. <laughs> like, you know, know him anymore. Yeah. yeah, like, unless you yeah, were he, in some way into the sport, or you might, like, we he, might know Sean Kelly, who's Irish. Nobody else knows right. any of and there and, and vis-a-vis drugs single-handedly put that sport on the map and in the news yeah. were it not for Lance Armstrong, it would just be a bunch of uh, elite erudites pedaling up the side of a fucking mountain for no reason. No yeah. one cares. No yeah. one cares. I don't, I don't care if they do it on fire. I don't, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Everybody like there's a huge proportion of people probably just assume that every cyclist in the world wears a yellow Jersey and it's a U.S. team postal Jersey. Yeah. You know, like that's the only image of cycling. Um, and yet, yeah. and yet Lance is, the the hated the dark horse nobody likes him well he's just honestly and i sadly um you know he's the anti schwarzenegger who yeah. you know, was very open and blatant about his drug use and managed to shrug it off with a smile lance is just an unlikable guy he's just yeah. a dick yeah that's, that's, a, the, yeah. that's the major problem it, he's just a cock of an individual yeah. and any reason to hate him more is just bonus yeah, if on a on a random note here, but do you think if so we did what it stops tomorrow? Do you think we'd see a huge increase in world records, or do you think we just see the steady kind of no? Because drug use is already there. Yeah, it, it, we wouldn't see a radical upturn. We're we're going to see an old up. I, I mean, I joked and said we're going to see a spike. We are going to see a spike in terms of total number of records, but it's only going to be incremental. Yeah, it's just yeah. going to be more total incremental records and more total weight classes and divisions and et cetera. But no, the, 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 the progression's already there. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it, the drugs are already a fundamental tool in sports. They're not, nothing's going to change, you know, the underpinnings of that. Yeah. So Broderick, in terms Probably of Probably the biggest thing that will change is the health of the athletes and therefore the career lengths and therefore probably more records later, simply because athletes are going to have a higher survivability. Oh, yes. That's what I was just about to ask is in terms of if those kind of reins are taken off, what are the advantages of that in terms of like youth sport, in terms of like safety of, of athletes who are developing and coming through? Well, that's that's the number one thing is the, you know, the, the, that would be the difference is the practices would have to be less absurd and convoluted and they could just get to the business of using the best tool for the job with the lowest repercussions and they would be healthier longer lived more competitive yeah you know i mean go I, I gotta unfortunately i have to jump off here but goldman made that argument 40 fucking years ago goldman made the argument that people that claim that they want drugs out of sports for health reasons are full of shit because if that was the case we would simply do health screens 
on the athletes. And lo and behold, what we would find is that athletes, by virtue of being fucking athletic, are healthy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which makes the whole drug argument moot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is the crux of the situation, and it is... It's hard to argue that with people too, though. Yeah. A project, this has been... Yeah, they just don't want drugs in sports because they personally have little floppy cocks and are a little scared about taking drugs, and so everyone should not be able to... Um, Project, this has genuinely been, I'd say, my favourite podcast to date. Um, and I feel like I just really want to go and drink a beer with you. Um <laughs> I do not drink alcohol, unfortunately, okay. but I understand your. I un, I understand the premise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so thanks very much for coming on, and we really appreciate you taking the time um, out of your Friday to come on. Of course, uh, it really means a lot to us. Please just pl- please absorb all the hate mail. I get enough of that on my own. Oh, we get plenty Other of that, that anyway. I have no request. We took a swing at the vegans a few months back, and it's been a solid. Uh, yeah. it's been a solid stream ever since. Yeah, we did the game changers, and we got we got our first bad review, our first and only bad review. Yeah, that's pretty easy. Yeah, I, I would say that's like shooting fish in a barrel, but fish are made of meat, so it's not even. <laughs> Project, thank you so much. Thanks very much. Um, 